The title of the sermon this morning is, It is Finished. It is Finished. We've been studying the Gospel of John for, for a while at our church, just going verse by verse, and we've finally made it to the crucifixion story of Jesus Christ. Theologian Karl Barth, he was one of the, the most influential theologians in the 20th century. And after winning, writing thousands of pages in his church dogmatics, his theology textbook, he arrived at this simple definition of God, the one who loves. When he visited the University of Chicago, students and scholars crowded around him at a press conference. One person asked, Dr. Bart, what is the most profound truth you have learned in all your studies? And without hesitation, he replied, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. How do we know that, that Jesus loves us? How do we know that God loves us? Well, it's true that the, the old children's song says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But how do we really know that God loves us? And this is not enough just for somebody to say that God loves you or for you to, to hear or read that God loves you. How do we know that God loves us? Well, the Bible tells us that God has proven his love for us in the most profound way through the cross of Jesus Christ by sending his son Jesus to die in our place for our sins. God proved his love for us on the cross. And so this morning, we're going to look more deeply at that story, the crucifixion story of Jesus. And so we're in John chapter 19. And uh, last time we were in, in John, we covered the trial of Jesus as he stood before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea. And Pilate did not, if you remember, want to crucify Jesus. He tried to wiggle out of it as much as he could. But ultimately, he caved in to the pressure of the Jewish leaders, and he sentenced Jesus to death. But not to worry, this is exactly what God had planned. This is exactly what Jesus had planned. This was all according to God's purpose. Jesus came to earth specifically to die. He came to die in our place for our sins. And so this was all part of the, the plan. So I just want to walk you through the crucifixion story this morning, and and we can learn more about the depth of Christ's love and sacrifice for us. So John chapter 19, verses, starting with verse 16, and we'll go through 42. And most of the scriptures should be up on the screen this morning if you don't have a Bible with you. So John 19, starting with verse 16. It says, Then he handed him over to be crucified. Talking about Pontius Pilate. Handed Jesus over to be crucified. Then they took Jesus away. William Barclay said, There was no more terrible death and death by crucifixion. Cicero called it the most cruel and horrifying death. Tacitus described it as a despicable death. Crucifixion had its origins in 600 BC. It was invented by the Persians and then passed on to the Carthaginians and then passed on to the Romans. And it was the dominant form of capital punishment by the Romans until AD 337. It was so terrible that the Romans refused to crucify anyone in the homeland. They wouldn't even crucify, crucify anyone in Rome. They only crucified people in the outer provinces, such as Judea and Jerusalem. In fact, crucifixion was so terrible that the Romans never even used it on their own citizens. It was only reserved for slaves, for the worst criminals who were not Roman citizens. The pain of crucifixion was so terrible that they had to invent a new word to describe its pain. The word excruciating literally means from the cross. Verse 17 it says, Carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Crucifixion always followed a standard pattern. When the criminal was condemned, the governor would say in Latin, Ibis ad crucem you will go to the cross. There was no death row. The sentence was carried out immediately. The criminal was placed in the center of four soldiers called a quaternion, and he was escorted to the site of the crucifixion. His own cross was placed on his shoulders. Now, typically, in a Roman crucifixion, the vertical beam of the cross was already in place at the site of the crucifixion, and so the victim just had to carry the horizontal beam but that in itself weighed about 100 to 200 pounds. And in Jesus' case, it had to be carried from inside Jerusalem at Pilate's headquarters 
all the way to the site of the crucifixion outside the city of Jerusalem. It was illegal to crucify someone within the city walls of Jerusalem. It was against their religious customs. So the Romans always crucified people outside of Jerusalem. And here it says that Jesus carried the cross by himself. In other gospels, though, we learned that Jesus had some help at some point, that the Romans forced a man named Simon of Cyrene to help carry the cross. So Simon, at the time that Jesus was carrying his cross to Golgotha, Simon, this Cyrene, he was coming into Jerusalem on business. It even tells us in the Bible the names of Simon's children. And so Jesus carried the cross until he got outside the city of Jerusalem and then out of sheer exhaustion could no longer carry it. And so the Roman guards just grabbed a man from the crowd. You carry this man's cross. So Simon carried it the rest of the way to Golgotha following behind Jesus. Now I want you to remember that at this point, Jesus had already been flogged. He was flogged, he was whipped, he was scourged before he had to carry his cross from inside Jerusalem to Golgotha. Now, in a typical Roman crucifixion, the flogging would occur at the site of the execution. But in this case, Jesus was flogged first, then he had to carry his cross all the way to the site of the crucifixion. Let me walk walk with you through what a Roman flogging looked like. First of all, the criminal was tied to a post with his arms and hands tied up over his head to fully expose his entire backside, his back, shoulders, buttocks, and legs. The whipping would usually last for 39 lashes, but often would go much longer depending upon the mood of the soldiers. The special whip had several names. It was called a cat of nine tails, a flagellum, a flagrum, or a scorpion. It had nine braided leather strands with heavy metal balls woven into them. Whipping would create deep bruises, which would eventually bust open as the flogging went on. The whip also had pieces of sharp bone and metal or bronze woven into the strands. And these pieces would dig dig into the flesh as the whip hit the body and then rip off flesh and cause deep cuts to the bone as the whip was pulled back. One scholar who studied Roman flogging said, as the flogging continued, the lacerations would tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Eusebius was a historian from the third century. He wrote about Roman floggings, quote, the sufferer's veins were laid bare and the very muscles, sinews, and bowels of the victims were open to exposure. Nabel Qureshi said, quote, they used what's called a flagrum, a whip that was designed to rip the skin off the body and cause excessive bleeding. After just a few lashes, the victim's skin began to come off in ribbons and their muscles tore. After a few more lashes, the muscles became like pulp. Arteries and veins were laid bare. Sometimes the flagrum would reach around the abdomen and the abdominal wall would give way, causing the victim's intestines to spill out. Obviously, many people did not survive a flogging. They they, they died before they were even placed on the cross. The flogging was so severe that it would cause the victim to go into hypovolemic shock due to the massive blood loss. And so, to understand what Jesus was enduring at this point, Jesus would have experienced four things after this flogging. Again, this is before he had to carry his cross. First of all, his heart would have been racing to try to pump blood that wasn't there. Second, his blood pressure would have dropped, causing him to fall down and pass out. You can see this is why he probably needed help carrying his cross. Third, his kidneys would have stopped producing urine to try to hold on to fluid. And fourth, he would have been very thirsty to try to replace the lost fluids from blood loss. So Jesus, again, had to carry this 100 to 200 pound horizontal beam, wooden beam on his shoulders all the way through Jerusalem outside of the city. And to make matters worse, flogging often continued the entire way to the cross. The whole time he's walking, carrying his cross, they continued the whipping. On the way to the execution site, 
In a typical Roman crucifixion, the criminal would be led through as many streets in the city as possible. They took the slowest route to get there. And they did this for two reasons. First of all, they wanted as many people as possible in the city to be warned this is what happens to those who commit sedition against Rome. But also, they wanted to give a chance, an opportunity, if there was any witnesses in the city who had not come forth. They wanted to give them a chance to come forth as he's carrying the cross through the city and say, hey, I want to defend this criminal. And scholars say that if that happened, the procession was halted and the case was retried. In Christ's case, nobody stepped forward. It says that Jesus was crucified at a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. Now, the Latin word for Golgotha is Calvary. And Calvary has become a very popular name for churches. It's a very popular word that we see in Christian books and Christian songs and literature. But Calvary just means Golgotha, the place of the skull, the place where Christ was crucified. We're not sure why they called the hill Golgotha. Um, scholars think probably it was sort of a hill that had the look of a skull to it. Let's move to verse 18. It says, There they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side with Jesus in the middle. So Jesus was crucified with two people on the sides of him, the left and right. When they finally reached Golgotha, the place of the crucifixion, Jesus was stripped naked. Then he was made to lie on the ground while his arms were stretched out and nailed to the horizontal beam that he carried. The nails were wrought iron spikes, five to seven inches long. They would have been driven through the wrists. Now in those days, the wrist was considered to be a part of the hand, an extension of the hand. But if the nails had been placed in the hands, then when Jesus was hanging from the cross, the weight of his body would have caused the nails to just rip through the flesh of his hands. So scholars believe that the nails were placed in his wrists, which means that the nail would have pierced, uh, pierced the median nerve in his wrist, which is the largest nerve going out to the hand. Now, what would that have felt like? Well, think of the pain that you feel, feel whenever you hit your funny bone. Now, imagine grabbing that nerve with a pair of pliers and squeezing and crushing it. That's the pain that Jesus would have felt because of the nails in his wrist. Then they would have lifted Jesus up and connected the horizontal beam to the standing vertical beam. All of his weight was hanging by his nail-pierced wrists. The weight of his body would have immediately caused his arms to be stretched an extra six inches, dislocating his shoulders. Then the soldiers drove a single nail through his overlaid feet. Sometimes the vertical beam would have a small piece of wood that served as kind of a seat. This was off, uh, common in Roman crucifixions. But this little seat was not an act of mercy, by no means. The seat, the purpose of the seat, was to help the victim survive longer so that the torture could go on. You see, for a victim to be able to breathe, he had to lift himself up every time he wanted to exhale. When you're hanging, you're in the inhale position. You lift yourself up to exhale. And so that seat would help the victim to, to, to stay alive longer and experience more suffering. The Gospel of Mark says that at this point, Jesus was offered wine mixed with myrrh. This was a sort of a narcotic. The Jews had a custom following an Old Testament principle in Proverbs 31.6 of giving pain medication, medication to victims of crucifixion. But when Jesus tasted what it was, he refused it. This was his most important hour, and he wanted to be physically and emotionally and mentally present. Jesus was crucified, it says, along with two other men, Jesus being in the middle. Traditionally, these men have been called thieves. But the Greek word for thieves is lestus. The Greek word, I should say, that's used here is lestus. It's the same word that's used to describe, to describe Barabbas. Do you remember that Barabbas was the criminal that they, the Jews chose to release instead of Jesus? And Barabbas, we know, 
was an insurrectionist, a revolutionary, a guerrilla fighter, a freedom fighter who hated the Romans. And that same word that was used to describe Lazarus is used to describe the two thieves on the right and the left of Jesus, which means these men were probably revolutionaries, just like Barabbas, and were probably Barabbas' um, compatriots. Okay, verse 19. It says, Pilate also had a sign made and put on the cross. It said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate replied, what I have written, I have written. So this is also typical of Roman crucifixion. A placard or a sign was made with the criminal's crime written on it. And oftentimes this sign was, was carried by one of the the Roman soldiers escorting the victim to the cross. Uh, sometimes it was hung around the victim's neck. Pilate had the sign inscribed with the words, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Pilate knew that Jesus was not a threat to Rome. He knew that Jesus was not a threat to national Israel. But Pilate put that on there because he needed a legitimate reason to crucify Jesus. The Jewish leaders oppose the wording on the sign. Don't put that he's the king of the Jews. Put on there that he merely claimed to be the king of the Jews. Pilate said, no. What I have written, I have written. He did that on purpose to frustrate them, to aggravate them. Pilate was highly frustrated with them because they had forced him to take part in executing an innocent man. Verse 23, it says, when the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, a part for each soldier. They also took the tunic, which was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let's not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who gets it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my clothes among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. And this is what the soldiers did. One of the perks of being a soldier at a crucifixion was that you got the victim's clothing. Sometimes it could be pretty valuable. Every Jew wore five articles of clothing, at least. They wore a head covering, a belt, sandals, outer clothes, and a tunic. The tunic was an undergarment, underwear, if you will, that was worn under the clothing, next to the skin, from the neck down to the knees or down to the ankles. The, the soldiers divided the first four articles of clothing among themselves, and then they cast lots for the tunic, which was usually a very expensive, a more expensive piece of fabric. And John, the author of the, this gospel, he points out that this is a remarkable fulfillment of prophecy. In Psalm twenty-two, eighteen, this was hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was crucified. This prophecy was made about Jesus. It says, they divided my garments among themselves, and they cast lots. For my clothing. The Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus was hanging on the cross, and as this was going on, that he also had to endure the mockery of the Jews, the, the, the people passing by, the people watching, and the Jewish leaders. They said things like, if you really are the Messiah, the King of the Jews, then come down from the cross, save yourself, then we'll believe in you, as if they hadn't had enough reason to believe in him already. And then verse 25, it says, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. You know, it's always risky to show public support for an enemy of Rome or even for an enemy of the Jews. But when Jesus was crucified, he wasn't alone. He had some friends, some close friends who stood by his side. And four of them that were mentioned are four courageous women. The first was his mother, Mary. This is a good example of a mother's love that it never fails. No matter what a person goes through, mom is always there. Also was his mother's sister, who we know from the other Gospels as Salome, the, the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee. And if you remember that the Gospel of John was written by John, the son of Zebedee, which means that John, the disciple that Jesus loved, was Jesus' cousin. And then there was Mary, the wife of Clopas, the mother of James the Younger and Joseph. 
And then Mary Magdalene. We'll talk a lot more about Mary Magdalene next Sunday, but Mary Magdalene was the woman whom Jesus delivered from seven demons. And so these four women, they actually traveled with Jesus as he went around um, Israel doing his ministry, and they helped to take care of Jesus and the disciples. And they were with him to the end. They were not fair-weather friends. They weren't only with Jesus at the height of his popularity and success, but in his darkest hour, they were there. Verse 26, I love this part. This gives us insight into the heart of Jesus. It says, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved, that's John, the author of this gospel, when he saw them standing there, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. And so from then on, Mary, a widow, went to live with John, the apostle John. So even in his dying hour, Jesus was focused on others. Ephesians 6, 2, it says, honor your father and your mother. Jesus displayed this. How do you honor your parents? Well, you obey them when you're young. And you take care of them whenever they get old. And that's what Jesus did. He took care of his mother. Now, G Jesus had several brothers and sisters. So the question has been raised, why didn't Mary go live with one of his brothers or one of his sisters? Why did she go live with her nephew, John? And it's been suggested that it's because at this point, his brothers and sisters hadn't put their faith in Jesus yet. But John was a close follower of Jesus, and so Jesus wanted Mary to be with him. Verse 28, it says, After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, he said, I'm thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was sitting there, so they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. Christ was thirsty. This is a, a reminder of Christ's humanity. Christ was fully God, yes, but he was also fully man. And he had to be man in order to die for our sins. He had to be God in order to die for the sins of the entire world. He had to be perfect in order to die for anybody else's sins other than his own. And it says they dipped a sponge in a jar of sour wine. Sour wine is also translated wine vinegar. It was the cheap wine in that day, the, the drink of ordinary folks. They held it up to his mouth with a hyssop branch. And a hyssop branch was a name given to a number of different branches back then, a number of different plants, so we're not exactly sure the type of branch it was. Verse 30, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. Jesus died right then and there. And the Gospel of Mark tells us that Jesus was crucified at 9 a.m., and then he breathed his last at 3 p.m. So Jesus was on the cross suffering for you and for me for six hours. The words, it is finished, are his last words. And these words are only recorded by John, not the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They say that Jesus cried out, gave a loud shout, and then gave up his spirit. But, but John tells us exactly what he shouted. He says, it is finished. What is finished? We're going to come back to that in just a moment. How did Christ die? A lot of scholars have put a lot of thought into this, and probably from asphyxiation and cardiac arrest. Asphyxiation is a fatal lack of oxygen. Cardiac arrest is whenever the heart stops beating and you die. And so when Jesus was on the cross, remember, he was hanging in the inhale position. Every time he needed to take a breath, he had to, to pull up. Or I should say he had to yeah, pull up with his wrists. He had to push up with his ankles, with his feet. The nail would push up in his feet, up against the tulsar bone, causing so much pain every single time. Eventually, you would just get too tired of pushing up to breathe. And so eventually, your heart or your breathing would slow down, leading to an irregular heartbeat. This eventually would lead to cardiac arrest and death. Verse 31. Since it was the preparation day, the Jews did not want the bodies to remain on the cross on the Sabbath. 
for the Sabbath was a special day. They requested that Pilate have the men's legs broken and that their bodies be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other who had been crucified with him. When they came to Jesus, they did not break his legs since they saw that he was already dead. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true and he knows what he is telling. He knows he is telling the truth. For these things happened so that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. Also another scripture says they will look at the one they pierced. So John says that it was preparation day, preparation for the Sabbath. Jesus and his disciples had the last supper on Thursday evening on the Passover. Then on Friday, he was crucified. And this was also called preparation day because Friday was the day you prepared for the Sabbath, which is on Saturday. So it was preparation day. Now, crucifixions in Judea, where the Jews live, was different than a typical Roman crucifixion in a couple of ways. By Roman law, a criminal would typically hang on the cross until he died. And this could last days. He could die from thirst, from starvation, from blood loss, from suffocation. He hung there for days in the heat of the day, in the cold of the night, tortured by the insects, by the wild animals. But the Jews had a law from the Old Testament that a person who was executed could not be left overnight, but had to be buried the same day. And so this meant that criminals needed to die that day and they needed to die before nightfall because the Sabbath began at fri- on Friday night at sundown. So in order to breathe, again, a criminal had to lift up in order to exhale. And so to hasten death, the Romans would take a mallet and they would smash and break the legs of the victims so that they could no longer push up to breathe. But when they came to Jesus, he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. Instead, they pierced his side with a spear, and it says blood and water came out. That's because they pierced his heart. The blood would have come from the heart. And surrounding the heart, there's a sac, a sac of fluid called the pericardium. And this fluid would have looked like water coming out. And so John points out that this, too, is a fulfillment of prophecy. He says in Numbers 9.12, it says that the Passover lamb's bones were not to be broken, reminding us that Jesus is our Passover lamb, sacrificed in our place. Zechariah 12.10 says that they will look at the one whom they pierced. And then let's finish off with the burial of Christ in verse 38. It says, after this, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate, that he might remove Jesus' body. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took his body away. Nicodemus, who had previously come to him at night, also came, bringing a mixture of about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes. They took Jesus' body and wrapped it in linen cloths with the fragrant spices, according to the burial customs of the Jews. There was a garden in the place where he was crucified. A new tomb was in the garden. No one had yet been placed in it, They placed Jesus there because of the Jewish day of preparation and since the tomb was nearby. So according to Roman law, again, in a typical Roman crucifixion, a crucified criminal was not buried. His body was just thrown away for the wild animals. But this was, again, illegal under Jewish law. He had to be buried that day. So two men, two followers of Jesus, stepped up. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, both of these men were members of the Sanhedrin, which was the Jewish high council, the Jewish senate, if you will, that ruled over all of Israel. Both of these men were wealthy, were prominent, were leaders, and they were both secret followers of Jesus during Christ's life because of their fear of the Jews. But when Jesus died, when they saw Christ die, it caused them to come out of the closet and admit their faith in Jesus. Joseph of Arimathea was a rich man, a good and righteous man, it says. The Bible says that when the Sanhedrin voted to kill Jesus, he stood against them. He disagreed with their decision. He received permission from Pilate to remove Christ's body and to bury it. He buried it in his own tomb, a brand new tomb that had never been used. It was probably bought for himself. It was cut into the rock. 
And then Nicodemus. This is the same Nicodemus who went to Jesus at night in John chapter 3, where Jesus said the famous words, you cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. He said the famous words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. This is that same Nicodemus. And it says Nicodemus brought, about, brought with him about 75 pounds of myrrh and aloes, enough for a king's burial. Very, very expensive. They wrapped Jesus' body in linen cloth, sort of like a mummy, placing the fragrant spices in the folds of the cloth, and they placed him in the tomb. So let's go back to Jesus' last words where he says, it is finished. It is finished. The Greek word for that is to telestai, to telestai. Now, what was finished? Well, to understand the cross, you need to understand the concept of propitiation. Here's a verse for you, 1 John 2, 2 on the screen. It says, he, Christ, is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. So to propitiate means to satisfy God's wrath with an offering, to pacify or appease or to avert God's wrath. So what is the wrath of God? A theologian, John Murray, says God's wrath is the holy revulsion of God's being against that which is the contradiction of his holiness. Theologian J.I. Packer says, and this is righteous anger, the right reaction of moral perfection in the creator towards moral perversity in the creature. So far from the manifestation of God's wrath and punishing sin being morally doubtful, the thing that would be morally doubtful would be for him not to show his wrath in this way. God is not just, that is, he does not act in the way that is right. He does not do what is proper to a judge unless he inflicts upon all sin and wrongdoing the penalty it deserves. God is righteously angry with sin and with sinners. Romans chapter 2 says that there is a day of wrath coming, a day when God's righteous judgment against sin will be poured out against sinners. Everyone will be repaid according to their works. And then Romans 3, it says that all of us are sinners. All of us are under God's wrath. But then you get to Romans chapter 4 and 5, and it says that now we can have peace with God and be reconciled to God and be forgiven through Jesus Christ, through faith in Jesus Christ. But what in the world happened? We are sinners. We're under the wrath of God. And all of a sudden now we can have peace with God and be reconciled to God through Jesus. Well, what, what does that mean? Well, that's where propitiation came, comes in. That's what Jesus did on the cross. That was the whole purpose. He died in our place for our sins, taking our punishment upon himself, averting God's wrath against us, which was poured out on him instead. The Greek word again for tetelestai, is for it is finished, to telestai, it's an accounting term. It was often used as an accounting term. In fact, archaeologists have found ancient tax receipts from that time period with the words to telestai written on them, meaning paid in full. Paid in full. That's what Jesus said when he died. It is finished, to telestai, paid in full. What did he mean by that? Well, what he meant was that Everything needed for your salvation, for you to go to heaven, for you to be forgiven and be reconciled to God, has been paid for. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do good works. You don't have to go to church every Sunday. You don't have to go to confession. You don't have to do penance. Everything's been accomplished by Jesus. The only thing you and I have to do is believe. All we have to do is put our faith in Jesus Christ. And so how do we know that God loves us? That's how we started out today. How do we know that God loves us? We know from the cross, from what Jesus Christ did for us. He went through all of that pain and suffering on purpose for you and for me. Romans 5, 8 through 9 sums it up well. It says, but God proves his own love for us. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood or made right with God by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? Amen? 
Let's bow our heads and close our eyes just for a moment. Father, we thank you so much for what Jesus has done for us. We pray, Lord, that meditating on the cross would help us to, to love you more. Let us remember, Lord, that this is not a fictional tale. That this is history. That this really happened. And that we really are sinners. And that we really did need a Savior to come and to die in our place. And that you really did that. In the next few moments, Lord, we pray, God, that you would move in this place and open hearts and eyes, Lord, to receive you now and to put their faith in you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, just going to take a moment longer this morning before we dismiss. Maybe you're here this morning and you're not sure that you have a right relationship with God. In other words, if you died today, you're not sure if you would go to heaven or hell. Maybe you try to be a good person. Maybe you know you're not a good person. But you're just not sure where you stand. But God loves you where you are right now, no matter what you've done. And he offers eternal life to you. He offers his forgiveness. He would love to be reunited to you as his child and him as your father. And all you have to do is make a decision that you're going to turn from your sins today and put Jesus Christ in charge of your life. And you're going to trust in what Jesus has done on your behalf. You're not going to trust in good works. You're not going to trust in being religious. You're going to trust in what Jesus did for you. And if you would just make that decision this morning, it's a real decision, a real commitment. I'm going to turn from my sins, and from this day forward, I'm going to walk with Christ as my Lord, and I'm going to put my faith in what Jesus has done for me. And if you will make that decision right now, this morning, in this place, Jesus will forgive you. He loves you, and he will take you back to himself. He will give you eternal life, and you can start a new relationship with God, a whole new life. But you've got to make that decision right now. And so, that's what I want to give you an opportunity to do. With every head bowed, every eye closed, just pray this prayer with me. If you're not sure where you stand with God, and if you would like to get right with God right now, and get saved, if you would like to be born again, if you would like to invite Jesus to come and to save you and to forgive your sins, then just say these words. Dear Jesus, say, say them quietly in your heart. Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I turn from my sins today and I put you in charge of my life. I trust that you died for me. Please save me. Come into my life. Make me a new person. Help me to follow you from this day forward. 